My name is Rich Johnson and welcome to The Creative Rant. Today we've got our awesome guest, uh, John Gress. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. And you're, uh, you're located in Chicago, right? Yeah, so we're, I think we're number four in the country for COVID-19 cases and maybe sixth in deaths, something like that. So, wow. um, but it's not that scary, so. Typically I do this, this little interview thing. I try to have guests come into my studio which would have been difficult for you to do anyway. Um, so the little bit of the plus side of this is that it's allowed us to be a little bit more innovative and come up with ways that we can connect and do these things remotely. So it's pretty good. Even if it takes 45 <laughs> minutes to figure out. <laughs> 40, 45 minutes to offer the best product possible. It's not that bad of a, a setup. Um, you do commercial photography, um, headshots, your Instagram's just amazing and just jam packed, tons of great work, lighting, your lighting just pops. Um, and you do a lot of teaching. Um, did, I, I did used the teaching to. come? You used to. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's pretend like this is, uh, you know, w <laughs> without that. Ago. So you used to do a lot of teaching. <laughs> did the teaching come out of, uh, of people asking how you're doing a ton of lighting or all of your lighting or a ton of questions about your lighting? Or was it something that you've always been interested in with teaching and educating to help photographers? I was always interested in doing it because I always, you know, I like helping people and that, that part's uh, really rewarding for me. But I never was really sure of the mechanism that I should take because for a while I thought maybe I want to be an adjunct professor at a university, but then I thought like, oh, the kids will just be taking the class for an easy A and I'll feel like it's a frustrating waste of time. And then it will lock me down as well. So I don't really think I wanna do that. And so essentially like I was just doing my thing and posting pictures and people kept asking me like, oh, when are you gonna teach workshops? When are you gonna teach workshops? And I was like, well, I don't know, maybe this winter. And then um, somebody from Orlando, Gary Hughes, uh, suggested me to PPA to teach at Imaging USA last year. And I thought, well, like, shoot, I better practice because I don't want to look like a total idiot when I have to be in front of, you know, 30 or 50 people in a pre-con class. And so I started doing those workshops in my studio with three people at a time. And after like three or four of them, I sort of had it down a little bit, but really, um, after imaging another friend, she told me like, oh, you should do workshops like all over the country and have those lined up so that when you go to imaging, people can sign up and, uh, you know, for something within the next two months right away. So I went ahead and did that and I had like 10 workshops set up around the country. And as it turns out, like everybody came from Instagram except for four people who came from Imaging USA. So if it wasn't wow. for like having that push to go to imaging, then I wouldn't have even probably like, you know, got started because I would have just kept putting it off and that sort of thing. And so, um, cause, cause basically like people would always hit me up and I would write down their email address and I'd be like, well, I'll get back to you. Maybe I'll do it sometime in the future. So, um, so that got me to do it. And I had a lot of, it was a lot of fun last year. I don't know if I, I, I went to at least a dozen different cities and I made friends with people all over the country. And that part was really great and rewarding. I met you and we were going to hang out in Orlando, but that got canceled. Yeah. And so it's just really cool to have friends everywhere. And there's just so many more people that I'm connected to now. And so I've really, that's like been the best part out of, out of the whole Instagram teaching thing for me is that I've made those connections. So your, your work is primarily featured on Instagram. That's like uh, where you kind of feature most of the stuff. Uh, so most of what I post to Instagram is my personal work because a lot of the things that I shoot for clients are either like embargoed for a really long time or maybe they're just not that interesting. Like nobody wants to, I'm not gonna get a lot of likes if I post a, uh, you know, a middle-aged executive a headshot, but you know, it pays the bills and it's a, it's a great part of, of what I do. Um, that's awesome to hear because like, that's always the struggle is uh, like, I want to post the stuff that's going to attract more clients, but really my audience on Instagram aren't my clients. They're not finding me on there. Um, 
so that's that's a good piece of advice is that because I, I wouldn't assume that you did that stuff just being a fan following your yeah. Instagram. <laughs> I wouldn't have Thank assumed you. that you did headshots and that you have stuff that you wouldn't be able to share. You get what I mean? Oh yeah, so absolutely. That's, that's pretty be cool. Because I found that I had no idea when I got onto Instagram that my followers were gonna be other photographers. I thought they were gonna be potential clients and I thought this was gonna be a great avenue maybe for me to expand my business, my traditional business, and I had no idea how things were gonna you know, uh, unravel. And so, when I post photos that are those environmental portraits of business people, like they don't get any traction. So a lot of the times I don't really even uh, post them or even if it's like a lifestyle image from a magazine shoot. When I post those, they, they also don't get a lot of oomph. But mostly because yep. I think people are used to seeing what I post all of the time and so the followers I have are attracted to those types of images. And if I post something outside of that avenue, then it just doesn't get any, it, it doesn't get a lot of uh, reach. So, yeah. um, so I tend to keep everything like drilled down to the personal work that I like to do. And, and what I do in the personal work too, is I'm, I'm practicing to be ready for when I have those paying jobs. So that if yep. there's something new that I wanna try out or some new piece of equipment, then I'm, um, I'm doing a few shoots with some models that I found on Instagram so I can really learn how that thing is and how it works. And if it wasn't for doing all the personal shoots on Instagram, then I wouldn't have um, increased my overall quality so that I can apply that to my paid work. Yes. So they sort of yep. go hand in hand. And really like when I was learning lighting starting in, when I was really learning lighting starting in the last recession, um, I was, I was more, um, well, I needed something to fill the time. So I started shooting, doing more model shoots and I was learning from doing those things. And I did apply those things I learned to the paid work. And before that period of time, I was only shooting like magazine covers of like, not magazine covers, but magazine jobs or some commercial jobs that were of people in the news or executives and that sort of thing. And I thought I was pretty good, but if it wasn't for doing those practice shoots with the models, I never would have gotten better. And then even when Instagram came around, like my skill level went up a lot higher just because I was putting in the work and practicing and, and getting better. So like, I would like encourage everybody, like if they can devote a little bit of time each week to themselves, and um, yep. do something they want to do, they'll probably, it'll help them grow, it'll make them happy inside. Of course, we all have a lot of downtime now, but when we're allowed to be within six feet of each other, like it's gonna be a great opportunity because things will be slow uh, yep. to sort of devote that time to getting, to getting better. Uh, even like today, like having this video conference uh, using real cameras and having yeah. those be streamed over the internet, like, this is nothing that I would have learned had this not happened. So yep. it's, this could be something to offer to a client in the future. Like you, you have no idea. So, well, and, and it wouldn't have happened if you had a, a shoot at five o'clock or six o'clock my time, right? Because exactly. we would have been, we would have been busy. Yeah. There would have been a million excuses on why this, this couldn't happen. Um, and I, yeah. I, and right now you're, lot, you're just preempting Dr. Phil, who no one should probably watch, uh, given his yeah. advice. <laughs> um, I, I preach a lot about the, the personal projects. That's what I call them as personal projects, um, because they allow you to fail without the fear of clients uh, pay backing it up, right? You're just not gonna take the risks. But let me ask you, with, with your personal projects, um, and and, the, and the, the test shoots that you're doing to practice a lot of this stuff that really get the attention. Do you ever find that your clients see that work, then they come in and maybe they're expecting that level of work, but they only paid for this level of work? Because headshots, I mean, headshots are headshots. They can't be, like if they're basic corporate headshots, I've had clients come in and they're like, that was fun and these are great photos, but what about that photo you did with like, you know, the exploding the water? Where's the, well, how come I didn't do that? Yeah. You know, do you run into that a lot or how do you handle that? I end up with, with individuals who want to hire me to do things and, and they think a lot of the times that I can just 
well, well, this background from this location was in this photo. I want to shoot there. And it's like, well, you know, we can't really shoot there. That's like someone's office, you know? Yeah. And, you know, so that's sort of the thing. Um, the other thing is maybe managing expectations sometimes. Like, you want me to shoot your business headshots, but like, what realistically do you expect that to look like? I'm not sure if that quite makes sense. Like I had an inquiry the other day and I, I sort of had to say like, what do you, what's your idea for this basically? Like yeah. for, for business headshots, because like if you want it to look like a school picture, that's one price. And if you want it to look like a portrait with a painted backdrop that takes me twice the effort or something, then it's going to be another price. Or if yep. you want it to be retouched to death, like that's another price. So yep. that's sort of more the thing. Um, well, and, the, and that's the thing that, that I noticed is that it's easy to blame the client for that when really it's, it's your communication to the client and you have to look at why they're not understanding what you're offering. The confusion is always with you and, and, if, and not, not with every client, okay? Some clients just aren't gonna get it or some inquiries, they're just not very bright, right? We can all agree on that. But if we have a rule here where if three clients mention the same thing, there's something that we're doing that we could change to help uh, fix that kind of thing. Well, I've so. almost, um, I've, I've had to realize that over time that a lot of times I think it's them and I have to realize that it's, it's me because I'm expecting them to have the same experience that I have and the same knowledge of lingo and expectations sometimes and I need to yep. make sure that isn't the case. And um, a lot of times before I ran out of them, I would watch these shows about airplane disasters where they break down what exactly happened in the crash and figure out what went wrong. And a lot yep. of the things in that is the pilots have to go over checklists. So I've actually thought about having a checklist for a client, particularly with video, because when I have those video clients, there's a bunch of questions you need to answer that you don't always think to ask. Like, what's the frame rate for this? What's the output resolution? Um, what's the exact length of the video? Um, uh, yeah. Well, I think it, I probably need a checklist to go over these right now. Um, yeah. Oh, what's the export codec? Or I had a client a few months ago that they hired me to shoot and edit this project. And then they decided that they wanted me to hand it off. Well, to someone else to edit. So they're not a video grapher. <laughs> I, I hate yeah, that word yeah. in general. You know, they're not, you know, they're not, they're not a visual professional. They're a marketing person. And so I have no idea. I'm not even talking to the person who's going to edit my video. That's in another country. I'm, it, they were in London. I'm just uploading it to Dropbox. And so I shot it all in raw with my C200 and they're like, you know, what the hell is this? I can't even I, open this. Yeah. You know, or then the question is like, do they even understand uh, oh, do they even understand log footage or do they want it to be color graded sort of in yep. advance? What is their knowledge? And so it's just those sorts of things because like they think they're hiring you to shoot a video and you're shooting the video you think and you hand off the footage to them and that person doesn't understand that this gray murky mess isn't, isn't something they're supposed to fix. They think it's Muddy, like, yeah. they think it's like a cheap camera or you messed it up. The photographer or the videographer messed it up or that yep. sort of thing. So it's just like those little things. Um, I think that's important too, because if, if I think we can all agree that, you know, Murphy's law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And if you have a checklist right up front for any project, you're basically eliminating some, some things that could go wrong, right? Like, Where's it's simple things that you don't even think about. Where's the shoot? How many people am I photographing? What is your expectation? Um, you know, what files, stuff like that. And now you, every time, every question on that list eliminates the ability for something to go wrong. And that's super important when it comes to a world that these people have no idea about. You know, the, the their only knowledge of a camera is on their phone or their uncle or someone cousin has a camera and they can take photos. Like that's it. So it's up to us as creatives to say, here is my process, here is what it is. 
you don't want to you don't want to get them all dumbfounded with like you know do you want a vlog or do you want this yeah. or you know but you if you just ask those questions like what are you looking for a final rounded out piece or are you looking for raw footage and if you're looking for raw footage who's editing it because i need to make sure they know what they're doing so that i don't look bad on my end because and and this is just my experience um most of the time when you're working with agencies or marketing agencies there's, you're usually working with someone in, in the middle that's working with a client, and that middle person is gonna do everything in their power to cover their own ass, everything. Which includes throwing someone else <laughs> under the bus if something which goes wrong. Which will be wrong. you, yeah. Which will be you, and, it, and you have to make sure that that's covered. Um, you don't wanna go over the head of the agency that you're working with because you wanna build that relationship, but you have to make sure that your ass is covered. Um, that's awesome. So um, another question I had is, is how long have you been in photography and why did you get into it? <laughs> so somewhere in between maybe high school and middle school, I borrowed my mom's camera and took it to summer camp. And at the time, I wasn't at all one of the popular kids. And so um, basically I, I found that having this camera was an avenue for me to actually connect and talk to and meet people. And so I, I really enjoyed that. And then somewhere in there, I decided that I, I wanted to be a photojournalist. So when I started off going to my high school photography class, the very first one ever, I already sort of had that plan in mind, I think. I think, I think, you know what, I think I wanted to be a sports photographer. That's what I really wanted to do, it's sort of like being an astronaut in a sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so, so I started off with that in mind and I, I kept doing that and then I started freelancing for a local newspaper that came out every week and I think I got paid $5 by one and maybe the other newspaper from the other town paid me $15 a picture or something like that. And that sort of led into me over time through college, uh, freelancing for the Associated Press and then working at a newspaper after college and then going back to freelancing again and then working for another wire service, uh, Reuters as a freelancer. And um, that sort of fizzled out with the recession and then that sort of is where I transitioned from being a uh, occasional commercial and um, yeah, from an occasional commercial and PR photographer to being mostly, yep. uh, uh, mostly that, and now it's mostly commercial. But I still shoot some PR events from time to time. I even might even shoot a wedding uh, once per year. I'm not sure. I have I have none on the books this year. I think last year I shot one. So, Good for you. Good for yeah. you. I so. <laughs> You know, it's sort of like it's sort of like you put out there what you really like to do, yep. and then you sort of like will take anything that people, especially well, think about it going in the future. You're going to take anything people offer you that pays money, uh, yep. more than your unemployment check that week. Yeah, exactly. I I agree. It's a slippery slope. I used to have photographers come into the studio and they'd say, "I want to get into photography." Okay, what kind of photography? I want to be a wedding photographer. Well, why do you want to be a wedding photographer? Well, because I want to make money. And it's like, nah, I don't, I make more off of a commercial gig than I will yeah. any wedding that I've ever shot, especially with the amount of work. If you, if you actually break it down based on the amount of work you do for a wedding, it's, it's night and day. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I agree though, you will start to take anything, but it's those personal projects that, that leapfrog you into where you really want to be because then you're showing your clients Bad work produces more bad work. Free work produces more free work. And only good work is going to produce newer, good work for newer clients. So, yeah. Yeah, and I guess one thing I should have said, like, yeah, we're all going to take kind of anything that comes along. But also at the same time, yeah. like, don't take something you're not competent in doing because you're not going to enjoy it. They're going to hate you for it. It's going to be very bad for, like, a a reputation sort of situation and, and I just wouldn't do it. So like if somebody comes to me for a boudoir shoot and that happens a few times a year, I just sort of send them to somebody else that I know because yep. like, I don't understand that in particular. Um, yep. so I'm just like, okay, well here, call this person. So the same, 
trying to think of there's I'm sure there'd be other types of things. I just can't think of one right now, but that, that's no, and that's I, true. And, and sure like, I, I've tried to do the same thing where when I started out, I would just, I would shoot anything. And even with the boudoir stuff, it's like, yeah, I'll shoot that. That sounds awesome. Yeah. And then I do it and I'm like, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> this does not look like, and, and it's so easy to look at someone's well-polished images and go, I can do that. When right. you don't have the luxury of seeing everything that it took to get to that point, it's like baby photography, newborn photography blows my mind. That would be mind. one, yeah. They, they're blows gonna be, my mind. They're gonna be I my niece them. or nephew if I do it. Yeah, exactly. It's someone that you could take a risk and like work with, but like I see these newborn shots and I used to be like, that's easy, it's a sleeping baby. How hard is it to photograph a sleeping yeah. baby? And then you get one there and they're not sleeping and you realize that it's actually more into it than, than just taking a shot of a sleeping baby. But that's cool. And so, uh, uh, again, a lot of your work on Instagram has a lot of behind the scenes, um, very, very instructional, lots of stuff, uh, telling people how to do stuff, um, showing them how they can create this stuff, a lot of uh, photo diagrams. Uh, what attracts you to uh, teaching photography? Probably that I didn't have anybody to teach me and I always wanted there to be like some sort of mentor who could guide me. And, and I, did, I did have that in different times in my career, but I never really had anybody to teach me lighting. And so I like that I can sort of help people out and maybe fast forward through all of that time where I was just doing trial and error and sort of like, you know, speed them up to the finish line a little bit. Like there's a lot of yeah. finesse to it that like you only learn from like doing it a lot. But, but if somebody explains to you this finesse, then it becomes, you know, a, a different way of, of thinking about things, making that light bulb go off, so to speak. Yep. And I feel with lighting, that's always, people are afraid of it. It's why we have a lot of natural light photographers. Um, they're afraid of it because it's, it's, it's different every single time. I, I always tell people when, when they ask me about lighting and strobes, I say, I say the, the number one secret to lighting is having, or off camera flash is having a good poker face. Because what you don't want to do is have someone, you're paying you to take photos and you're like, this light's not doing what I want it to do right now. And especially when you're running from like office to office and doing different things. So I, I like that you give that breakdown. Um, and, I, and I think too, that it should be noted that even with your breakdowns, if I mimic those exactly the way that you do them on your diagrams, I'm gonna get different results in my studio than you're gonna get in yours. Like I noticed that you have a lot of brick and a lot of props that are gonna reflect and bounce differently. My studio is white. I have giant white yeah. walls. So my challenge is always masking out light. Um, you know, that's so, been, so. That's been one of the great, that's been one of the great things about teaching is that I've got to, I've got to shoot in a lot of different places and try to recreate the same pictures. And it's, it's a great experience because you really start to learn and master the idea of like, where is this fill coming from? And how do I create contrast in any situation? Like one of the first ones I did that was in a white wall, white ceiling, shiny gray floor place. It was like so trying to figure out, but, but now I know what I would do to get the same look. Even like when I moved to this studio, um, it took me a while to figure out like fill because in the last place, the ceilings were shorter and the walls were closer. And so everything bounced around differently. But, but now that I've had this experience going everywhere, it's, it's not only can I now teach it, I've learned it, I guess, so. Do you still find yourself in situations where you're questioning like, like what you, how you're gonna set up your light or it's not reacting the way you want it to? Oh, absolutely. And you know, that's part of the, that's part of learning that space and and even part of it too is like learning the subject so like i might have an idea that works for a particular um skin tone and then learning like can i adapt it to this other skin tone and how is that going to work out or you know what if i'm thinking of one in particular where 
the floor was shiny gray and I was trying to get a lot of contrast and I couldn't quite get what I wanted. And part of that was face shape. The person had really defined features, but it wasn't like hollowed out underneath. So I'm like trying to light it and it's looking flatter than I want or not as contrasty as I want. And clearly I've gotten lost in this problem and forgot your question, sorry. No, that's it. That's my question <laughs> is, do you still get lost in problems? Oh yeah, well I clearly that, I even got lost in my yeah. answer. Yeah, <laughs> that's so awesome. <laughs> and when, so, I try, when I try to do something new, like if, if I'm doing something I'm competent in doing, I can knock out the look in 30 to 45 minutes. If I'm doing yeah. something I've never done before and, and I'm really, really trying to perfect it, it might take me an hour and 15 minutes per look. It just, it just so, really depends. So do you, set, do you set up your lights before your clients come in and change them throughout the session or do you just do you set them up before they come in or do you set them up while they're there? How does that work? It sort of depends on, on how proactive or how lazy I was that day. So I, nice. I would like to have it set up before they get there, but then sometimes I'm just like, uh, they're gonna come in and they're gonna be like fussing with their hair and makeup and their clothing. I can just set this up as soon as they get here. Like, yeah. So I, I use just, it as a little bit of a, um, I, so part of me, I don't, sometimes I don't set it up before clients come in only because sometimes they're coming in blind and I don't know what they look like. Right. So I usually walk them through and I say, you know, just so you know, I typically have my studio this way so that I can see who you are, what you're wearing, base my lighting off of that. Part of that is because I don't want to set up before they come in that lazy part. Um, but that's kind of, and then I use that time to talk to them and get to know them about what they do. Oh, you're an accountant. What kind of accounting? Oh, this and that. So it, it, it kind of works with that too. But I am glad to hear that it's not just me that's like, oh, I gotta go set up for this shoot. Cause when you're in the shoot, you're like, grab this light, do that, do this, do this. And it's yeah. different, but before it's kind of like, it's like a cold start, you know what I mean? You know, like it takes me, it takes me forever to like uh, pack up at the end. Well, that's different. Yeah. Okay, so if I'm in my own studio and I have a live workspace and I am tearing down, it'll take me like two hours to put everything away. If I was on location at somebody's office, it would take me 20 Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I, have no, I have no idea why it's so hard, but it is. Um, and a lot of the times when I do have somebody coming to my studio, I'll do one setup and then I'll have that ready and then I'll adapt it as they go. If I do, if I do plan ahead, when I do executive shoots, I, I light it. I, I try to arrive an hour before. Sometimes that ends up being 40 minutes. And then I have a very rushed, like, um, hustle period where I'm getting yep. everything set up so I can just like cycle them through, um, quickly and I can do different setups. So it really just sort of depends, but, but usually I am on that winging it. That's cool. Of, yeah. So what do you think is the single most important thing in photography? Probably to, to practice. Um, a lot of people just think that they're going to buy this equipment and they're going to be fantastic. And it just doesn't really like work that way. Just cause you know, it's like that common, you know, uh, that common thing that like a non photographer says to you, like, Oh, you must have a really nice camera. Yep. Like I taught LeBron James I must I have taught a, it everything it knows. Yeah, like LeBron James <laughs> must have a really nice basketball. It's the shoes. You know? It's the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> and if you buy them, you too can do that. So, so yeah, it's just really like I have gotten so much better just by putting in time and and doing the work and learning from my mistakes. And and maybe that's it. Maybe it's that you need to experience failure and then get better from it. And 100 percent. Yeah. And if yeah. And if you're not like if you're just thinking that you're going to be completely ready to do client work when the clients call, it's probably not going to work that way. You've probably got to practice before uh, they get there. So I think we live in a world where we have a fake it till you make it mentality. And I'm guilty of that. A hundred percent. I want to take on as many jobs as possible. Um, and it's only until I started maturing in my craft and really looking at photography as a craft, I started to notice that that's not the best way to do it. And it was actually more of a liability 
than it was helping me because you have to get to the point where you know how to turn clients down because you're not going to produce the work that they want, right? And it's not going to be a good relationship for either of you. And you have to do that with grace where you're not just like, I'm sorry, but I don't want to be your photographer because this isn't going to work for us, right? But that that's important to, to have that. It's good to hear that, like, you think that they should learn the craft as much as possible before going out, not before, but probably sim simultaneously, but at least continuously doing that. And I like hearing that you're still, you still do that. Um, that makes me feel better because I still do that as well. You know what I mean? So, so, so you're saying you turn stuff down when the budget was too low for what they were asking maybe, or that what they were asking you to do wasn't in your expertise? Some, sometimes I will turn down work, not, it's very rare that I'll turn down a gig based on budget. I, I mean, if they're just not in my price range, it's like that, that's not really me turning it down. Um, that's them not being able to afford me. So um, if it's, but what I'll turn down is if, if I, I have some red flags when I'm interviewing clients on the phone, I shop for them as much as they shop for me because the last thing I want is for a client to come in and not be happy with what I'm going to produce. It's the same thing with the boudoir or newborn stuff. If, if I'm not going to mash or mesh well with this client, they're going to be nothing but a problem. And I don't really want to deal. There's not enough money for them to jeopardize my five stars on Yelp. You get what I mean? So I kind of look at it that way. This is more like an individual who wants to hire you for something. Versus oh yeah, absolutely. A commercial. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, cause here we do two, we do, we do headshots, uh, corporate headshots, law firms, architects, and stuff like that. And then we also do agency work. The agencies are a little bit different because most of the time with agencies, we have the opportunity to build a relationship with the project managers and the creative directors. And even though agencies tend to have a lot of turnover, um, you're constantly kind of dealing with the different personalities. But in agencies, it's about the, gre the greater good let's get this done even if I don't like working with that person kind of thing. And I feel like agencies most of the time will vet you based on the project. There's some projects that, that even agencies we work with all the time, they're like, we have a photographer that's gonna cover this specifically because they specialize in this, product photography or something like that. Yeah, like, so, like I, don't, I don't necessarily want food or cars or something. Exactly, for yeah, instance. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't even fight for that stuff, but I feel like 10 years ago, I would have been like, Hey, why didn't you call me for the food photography? And I they would have been like, well, yeah, I could do that. And it's like, then you get there and you're like, no, you can't, you can't do that. So that's really cool. Um, all right. So my last two questions, and, and I try to round all of these interviews out with this. Um, and this, this, there is no right or wrong answer on either of these, but what is the number one thing you hate the most about being a creative? <laughs> okay, let's think through that. Um, yeah. <laughs> my first thought is editing video for a client who doesn't think that there is a story that needs to be comprehensive. Part of it is they think the editing should take hardly any time at all, or they don't understand that what they're asking you to do is a big ask. So that's part of it. And I'm not really sure how to educate them on that other than my initial thing is usually to say that I'm charging, um, I don't remember what the last charge fee was. It's something like 150 for 30 seconds of finished video. Nice. Uh, yeah. And that has to do with a particular length. I know that I have it spelled out somewhere, but just yeah. just keep that as a, a general idea. Just it's so in a I'm signaling. Somewhere. Yeah, just like I'm signaling to them, like, hello, this thing you're asking me to do, this one minute video is actually like, and a one minute video is actually like an eight hour <laughs> ordeal. Yeah. Yep. So, and I think they have no idea that that's what it is. So, like, too many revisions. Um, the other thing in video is probably like not understanding that they need to communicate to me what their idea is. If it's, this is like a, an advertising piece and yep. what's our 
story and what are the things we need to convey this story. So, um, I mean, I'm fine with working with clients and developing that. It's just sometimes like they just think you can just wing it and shoot stuff and like everything will be okay. But like, yep. it's like, I don't, I want to point my camera at things. I, I want to record things I need to record and like do them well, not just like spray and pray. So maybe that's, that's one of them. Yeah. Um, and then still wise, it's probably those people that expect that you're just going to, that have unrealistic retouching expectations, maybe for them personally, maybe that actually goes for everybody. Like a lot of people don't have a grasp of like what they look like and yep. what's possible for that. Yep. Maybe. That, that sounded a little harsh. I don't mean it that way. No, but I, mean I, like, I agree. So uh, I always say my biggest challenge as a photographer because of, of what we do is we deal with however old that person is, we deal with that many years of self image and confidence because we could be, our lighting can be on point. Our, our poses could be perfect, but it doesn't matter if they're having a bad hair day, if they don't like the way their nose bends, all of these things that we all yeah. have, we have to combat that. So it, like, and that would be, I get what you're saying where it does sound harsh, but it's true, it's, it's a challenge because when I go buy a hamburger, I go buy a hamburger, I give you money, you give me a hamburger and either I like it or I don't, it's still subjective, but I'm not putting 38 years of my experience with burgers onto that burger place. And for some reason as photographers, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like we're almost, we become almost like, uh, like psychiatrists or like counselors where they're like talking to us about things and it's like, why are you telling me this? But yeah, then, and right. they start to confess, oh, I don't like my hairline. I don't like this. And, and they mostly hide behind it with the comments that we all hear. Oh, I hope you have your skinny lens today. You're going to retouch yeah. this, right? Well, I actually want to know what their, um, sometimes their that really are. helps if there's something that they don't like, that's something you can easily avoid. Um, yes. I'm not thinking of, they'll often think like, oh, uh, this eye is bigger than the other. And you're like looking at it like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I don't see that, yep. but maybe that'll affect how you retouch the picture. And you know, I actually, I keep yeah. a, uh, I keep a translucent uh, plastic ruler on my desk that I think I've had since I was like in school and, and I will hold it up to the screen and I will like measure in those instances. If they say yeah. one eye is bigger than the other, I will measure the eye on the screen, both eyes. That's and, amazing. And even it out. So, um, wow. I just, I just realized that the face detection was on on my camera and this was very confusing. Yeah. It's like, what's going on? What's <laughs> happening? But that, that's good. That's a good point though, is that you have to be, don't, don't brush off those comments when your clients make those tuck them away and use them because if, if they're saying, you know, I think this size bigger than that one. Well, if that's the case, let's move the one that you think is smaller, closer to the camera because yeah. that's going to help with that. Right. So don't just brush those things off. Listen to your clients and, and, and use those things to your advantage because they're used to people not hearing what they're saying. And if you pay attention to that, that's going to translate into them loving working with you and, and it's going to make you a better photographer. This is all of this stuff is a fraction of what we do. Like get that out of the way. And, and like you said, listen to them and show them like, look, I, I fixed it. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. they'll know that you fixed it. I was yeah. just having all of these memories back to someone saying they wanted their nose to look less broad after I sent them the photos. And I can't even remember what it was. It was like whatever they were saying to me didn't make sense. Yeah. And then even when I did it, I was like, they were like, it looks narrower in this one compared to that one. And I'm yeah. like, okay. So I, you know, I get out the ruler and liquefy. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> to, to a I've photo had those that, before too. A photo that had never been liquefied in the first place, and you're just like, yep. uh, okay. <laughs> yep. I've so. had those before too, where they're like, I want this to be warm. But, but use not yellow. blues. 
but use blues. Yeah. And it's like, that's not how this works. I'm sorry. And it's so hard not to be like this artist diva about it. I think with experience, you have to like handle these things as they come on. So I hear from you that your least favorite thing about being a creative is, and not as specific details, but it's more the, uh, I guess the misunderstanding of what it is we do as creatives and not fully grasping what they ask for. And I think that's because it's a, we're almost, our society's a victim of things in our hands. These things come in and out. People don't think about taking photos anymore. So we're offering a service that they take 30 of them a day with, right? So like of, so we have to say, listen, yeah, this takes 45 minutes for me to set up. And that's why it doesn't look like your phone. Yeah. You know, and, and I get what you're saying. That's, that's interesting. Um, I think that's, I, guess a now that I think, I guess now that you've analyzed me, I think that I probably would be a happier creative person if I just outsourced all of my post-production. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that would probably take up a third of my income or something. So that we're here to, we're here to solve problems. I mean, yeah. that's what we're doing here. Yeah. So, um, and then my, my last question is a follow, it's the same question, but, um, obviously different. And I want to end on a happy note. What do you love the most about being a creative? Oh, I, I think that it's that I don't have the, hmm, that's a good question. Um, I never really think of myself as a creative person. Sometimes I kind of think of myself as more of a technician of sorts. That's until, interesting. Yeah. Until, but then, then I think I've started to realize over the last few years that like, no, I really am artistic. I'm not just a technician. Whereas before I kind of thought that way. And maybe part of my thinking comes from like when I was a journalist and I didn't really, um, I'm capturing things that are happening and my creativity is for seeing where that's going to occur and where I need to be to make that picture happen and kind of pre-visualizing what it's going to look like when it does, which doesn't, which is creative, but it doesn't feel very creative. It just sort of feels like I'm getting the picture slightly better than the guy who I'm elbowing to, to my right or left or the, you know, the woman to my left or right. So, yeah. um, so I, I think it's probably that I'm able now to create portraits of people now that I'm doing what I'm doing now, not 10 years ago, I can create these portraits of people that I've like from lighting ideas that I found online or art direction ideas that I found online. And I can sort of, unlock that new concept or lighting idea and, and, and make it work. Even if it takes me an hour and 20 minutes to, to, to do it, like that's just a lot of fun for me. It's like very rewarding to know that like I've solved this problem, I guess. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's like yeah. problem solving or even just like creating something that, that other people really like and it also is something that I had to put a lot of work into. I, I don't know if that, that's a very meandering answer, but maybe no, an and, and, and not to analyze you again, but I think I'm going to. Um, it, it sounds like your original approach being uh, calling it a technician thing. It was very like formulaic where it's like, here's a recipe. Here's how I do this. And it's hard to kind of imagine that as a creative way to do that. Now, what it sounds like is that now that you're more comfortable with those formulas and they come second nature, it's allowing you to truly appreciate the creativity that went into fix it, or finding a recipe for that solution in the first place. Yeah. And th yeah. that's really what it sounds like to me. So that's awesome. Yeah, or it's, it's like maybe I have so many recipes in my head now that I'm just sort of like combining them together sometimes or or drawing from something else. I think, um, uh, you know, so lately, lately because uh, I have nothing else to do, I've been making YouTube videos. And so I have 10 of those right now that are scheduled. So I nice. think the one that's coming out tomorrow morning is, is about a lighting setup that I did um, where I, I took a hard light source and I put a screen for a radiator between the subject and uh, the light 
and I projected nice. that onto their face. But then I didn't like the fact that that screen pattern was like on this part of their nose and like under their eye. So then I had to think back to like, I was like, hmm, I wish I could like change the shape of the screen maybe so that it didn't do that or, or maybe I could block it somehow. And then I got this idea that I could build a dodge and burn tool like I used in the dark room 20 years ago to solve my problem. And so I actually like took a piece of cinefoil and made a, like a little triangle or rectangle and I taped nice. it to yeah. the end of a straw and I just sort of like, with the modeling light on, I just sort of like moved it in and out between the screen and the person's face to where I blocked the, the thing perfectly and I sort of went over and bent the edges of the foil and got it to be the shape that I needed so that I only had the light to go where it needed to go. So that's perfect. Yeah. So maybe that is what makes me the most happy is like figuring out these like tricks from old tricks or that sort of thing. Trying something new and, and not yeah. realizing that something old was going to be the solution. I think that's what separates people from from creatives from non creatives is the ability to know that that's OK to walk over and do that. I okay. think if someone was following your recipe and, and they look at your diagram, they would go. Well, I can't do that. You know what I mean? So it's, it, they'd be like, I, I, well, it, he doesn't say you can do that. Why should I do that? So it's, it's, that's the thing that separates us. But that's really cool, man. So how, how can people find you? What, you know, um, where, where do you want to direct people to? Um, obviously, your YouTube and your Instagram. But, um, you know, w what else do you have going on with that stuff? So. Uh, so I actually write a blog post for every YouTube video that I put on my website. So if you went to johngress.com and then at the top just clicked on the word blog, it would take you to it. So part of that, it's, it's a, it's, <laughs> so sometimes I make the blog post first and that influences the video and sometimes I make the blog post second. But essentially it's a written companion to the, the video so that if you don't like watching a video, you can read about it. Or maybe the, the written part will have a little bit, the written part will have maybe a little bit more detail. Um, and, and so that's another thing. So on YouTube, if you just search for John Gress, I'll be coming out with a video every week. And then on, uh, and then on Instagram, it's just John Gress Media. So I could see the logo Perfect. in my head, but I couldn't see anything else. <laughs> I'll pop it up on the screen. Uh, you know, well, I'll have it on the screen for you to, to so people will be able to do, uh, just type it in or click the link in the URL. But anyway, thank you so much for doing this with me. Um, it's, it's awesome having you on here. I mean, I can't, I, I've been following your work for a long time. Um, I was super happy to meet you at the PPA. I was even happier to realize that you were such an awesome guy and so nice and thank just you. very giving. And it's a very genuine, uh, that what you guys see online and is not fake. This is John. John is the happiest, nicest guy out there and genuinely wants to, to hear about what you guys are doing. So uh, thank you so much for being here. No, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.